The word of the Lord says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God and the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. The Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving it to us as, as, a, as a doorway into your presence. And I pray that we would walk through that doorway this morning, Father. May your presence, may your spirit be exalted and magnified in us and in this building this morning. May we be touched in our hearts and our souls. And may you be the author of all that goes on in here. Father, we thank you and praise you. We give our lives to you in your precious name. Amen. Better is one day. Psalm 84. That's what we're talking about today. And, and as I read through this passage, um, there's a lot of things going on in my mind. This is, this is something I really enjoy. I like this passage. I like this psalm. I like verse 10. It really impacts me. Um, but I was thinking this week, and I was thinking about how experience goes a long way towards defining our reality, doesn't it? Uh, in other words, if I was to have a conversation with you about going for a hike, like where are the favorite places you go for a hike? I can tell you there's places I would like to go for a hike. Like one of the places to go on my bucket list is to Yosemite. I would love to go out to Yosemite National Park. I've never been there, but I want to hike Half Dome. I think Half Dome would be one of the neatest hikes in the world. It's more of a climb than a hike, using ladders that are bolted into the back of the rock. And if you've never seen Half Dome, it's just this huge mound of granite that's domed over the top and then kind of cut off in the back. Half Dome, pretty cool, huh? I would love to go hike Half Dome. I would love to go walk by Mirror Lake and see what the reflection on Mirror Lake actually looks like. I would love to sit at the base of El Cap and just fantasize about what it would take to actually climb that and if I could actually do it or not. Just, just, to, just to be in the presence of all that granite and that magnificent setting atmosphere would be phenomenal. And I would love to go there. And I can tell you that, and we'd be like, yeah, that'd be a cool place to go. But I've never really been there. I've never really been there. I haven't been there. <laughs> it's not like I was kind of there. I wasn't there at all, right? Scott, you get a little metaphysical. All right, well, whatever, it's cool. But if you were to ask me, say, hey, Scott, let's talk about hiking in Utah. Like, let's talk about hiking some slot canyons, or let's talk about hiking it at Zion National Park, where you're hiking the Narrows, where you're hiking this riverbed for about 17 miles, or, or if you hike Angel's Landing, which is literally one of my favorite hikes in the world. We could be busy for hours, Literally hours. You could be busy listening to me. I could be busy talking because this is something I've experienced and a place that I've been to, and it left an impression on me. It was phenomenal. And so I would love to talk about that, but I wouldn't be talking out of hopes and dreams, would I? I'd be talking about the intimate details, how you need to prepare, both physically and mentally, to hike, you know, however, what is 18 miles down this stream, but how you would have to prepare physically and mentally if there's a flash flood and to look for all the things and what gear to take and how to eat and how to recover and all this stuff. I can tell you the ins and outs because I've experienced it. I've been through it before. Why do I bring that point up this morning? Because as I was reading through this psalm, although it wasn't 
it was written by the psalmist. It wasn't words spoken by Christ. I thought about the life of Christ. It was interesting. Jesus Christ, as we're going to be talking about in the next couple weeks, when he came to earth, we're going to be celebrating his birth. When he came to earth, the question that was ringing through my mind, and the thing I'm convinced of, is that he had knowledge of what it was like to be in heaven. When he was on earth, he had knowledge of what it was like to be in heaven. One time I was curious as to what it would actually take somebody to train for a 100-mile ultra marathon, like these trail runs that crazy people do. Not the ones that I do, the real crazy people, right? I'm like, how do you train for a 100-mile event? And I, and I got on, and, and one guy said, what I do, he goes, I don't go out and run 30 or 40 miles on a Saturday. He goes, I pick a five-mile loop that's got almost all the different kinds of terrain that the race is going to have in it, and I run that route, same loop six, seven, or eight times. So I get my 30, instead of doing a 30 or 40 mile loop, I do this five mile loop six, seven, eight times. He said, the reason I do that is simply this. The hardest part about a 100 mile endurance event is up here. He says, when you get to more mile 40, 50, 60, 70, you just want to quit. Your mind starts going, oh, I'm, I'm done. You know, I, I don't have to put myself through this. He goes, when I run that five mile loop, every time I run past my car, you know what I think? Boy, it'd be nice to get in the car and go home right now. Boy, there's things I could be accomplishing at home. He said, I train on that five-mile loop because mentally it's more difficult for me than going out and running 30, 40 miles. When I get out 20 miles, i got to run 20 miles back. No, when I get out two and a half miles, I have to run two and a half back. Did Christ experience that when he was on earth, I wonder? Man. Look, God, I've been through it. I know what it's like. I really just want to come home at this point. Because that's the option that he would have had, wouldn't it? And yet he chose to go through life on earth. You see, Christ, in my opinion, would have possessed this knowledge of what heaven is like. He would have known what it's like, what? To be in the courts of God. Wouldn't you just love to have a little reflection in your life of what that's truly like? See, it's also kind of what the author of Psalm, this Psalm, Psalm 84, is referring to in this passage. How lovely is your dwelling place O Lord Almighty. See, this author never personally, physically experienced it. But this author yearns for it. He longs for it. He desires for it. It is the cry of his heart. Verse 2. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. This passion can only be known through experience. From knowing someone intimately. You see, just because he has never been to this place physically, he still has a very real and intimate relationship with God. I mean, you don't write these words about something you feel half hearted about, do you? I mean, I don't stand up front of you on Sunday morning and say, you know what? My soul longs for a piece of pizza. Even if it's from Pizza King and covered in sausage, right? My heart and flesh don't cry out for the 49ers to win another Super Bowl. Right? Yeah, I think you're like, yeah, most of you are like, thank heavens. I do not grow faint over a monster buck getting shot next weekend in my presence. Right? Why do I bring it up? These are all things that I thoroughly enjoy and I want to happen. I strongly desire that they happen. But I don't base my life around them. My value and worth as a person are not determined by pizza, they're not determined by football, and they're not determined by hunting. They're determined by a God who loves me. And he loved me so deeply that he sent his only son into the world. My soul aches along with the author of this passage for that kind of love, the one that truly satisfies my desires and satisfies my inmost beings. And that's why I love this piece of writing. You see, verse 3 says this, Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. God provides with his abundant goodness, even for the sparrow's, and the swallows. 
It kind of reminded me when I read through this passage, it reminds me of a passage in Matthew, chapter 6, verse 26, where Christ says these words. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And this author in Psalm 84 brings up the same thing. Even the sparrow has found a home. The swallow has a nest for herself. We worry so much about things we can't control. I do. That's we collectively. I know you do too. I experienced it last Sunday. You remember how I had to bust out of here to go to a wedding ceremony down in Lancaster at 2 o'clock and I had the wedding rings on me and I had the marriage certificate on me so I kind of sort of had to be there along with signing the marriage certificate. So I guess in a way I didn't have to be there. They were going to start when I got there no matter what. Anyway, I was worried about getting down there. I had about a three-hour window, a little over a three-hour window for about a two-hour and 45-minute drive. And I did not go much faster at all than I normally drive. And I say that jokingly, and yet in all honesty. Normally, I set the cruise a couple miles above, and I go. And that's what I did, maybe a mile, two miles an hour faster. What should have been about a two-hour and 45-minute trip took me two hours and 20 minutes. And I'm convinced it was because people were praying for me. Even people from the bride's church, whom I had never met anybody from that church, let alone her parents, until the day before, we're praying for me. How did your trip down go? We were praying for you this morning. I don't bring that up because we're not, we're not talking about faith. We're not talking about prayer. Well, we're always talking about faith. We're not specifically focusing on these things this morning. But on my way down last week, I kept thinking to myself, what if I get in a traffic jam? I'm going to be freaking out. I will start sweating. I'll start getting anxious. I'll start getting nervous. And you know what? There's absolutely nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing. I can't change it no matter what. I can get off and try and detour at the next exit, but that's not going to matter how much I'm stopped up, is it? There's absolutely nothing I could do if I get in a traffic jam to control that, and yet I would still worry about it. The very next verse, Matthew 6, 27, Christ says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? None of us. And yet I still worry. It's ridiculous. Matthew 10, 29, Jesus also says these words, Are not two sparrows, again, this bird theme again, sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. God has provided a nesting place for the sparrow. Are you not much more valuable than they? The author realizes this, and that is why he refers to God at the end of verse 3 as what? My King and my God. My king and my God. How do you refer to God? Does your language of, about, and to God reflect his holiness and his provisions in your life? Not just this week, not just the week of Thanksgiving when we put this special emphasis on giving thanks, but in every week, in every day, in every situation and circumstance, how does your language reflect God's love in your life? And then we're going to do this really weird thing. We're going to jump from verse 3 down to verse 9, and you'll see why, because I'm kind of mixing it up a little bit here. It's like a potluck dinner. I'm just throwing it all on the plate and going to town. Verse 9. Y'all are getting hungry. I'm talking about pizza and potluck dinners. All right. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Do you realize, I, I ask you guys this often, usually once every month, two months, three months. Do you realize, maybe not this specific question, Okay, but one worded similar to it. All right, Scott, focus in. Do you realize what? Do you realize that you are the anointed one? Do you realize that you are the anointed one? Do you feel like the anointed one? Do you fit the stereotype of the anointed one? Do you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and say, wow, there is the anointed one? I hope not. If you do, keep it to yourself. Why do I bring that up? Because that's exactly what you are. That's what this psalmist says. You are anointed. Not because of who you are and what you look like in the mirror, but because of the God you serve. You are not anointed because of your inherent goodness. You are not anointed because of your inherent righteousness. You are anointed because of your relationship with the Son. You are anointed because you know Jesus Christ, if you have that relationship. I'm going to show you a video. It's about a five-minute clip. I was going to tell the story and read a little bit, but the video does a far better job of explaining what I'm trying to get across here than anything I could read or, or, or talk to you about. 
understand this. The best video that I could find that sums up this father-son relationship in this two specific people is a little grainy, okay, which means the resolution is not real great. It's not going to be great. I apologize for that. You're not going to miss the point of the video. If you have some tissues, you may want to get them out. That's just a warning, okay? I'll probably grab some when I'm down there too. But let's watch this video. Also, it's a YouTube video, so if there's any pop-ups, I'm sorry about that. It's just the video is powerful. It's good. If we could hit the lights and then get the video, that'd be great. Like I said, a pretty powerful video. Do you realize that God feels this way about you? Do you realize that God feels this way about you? Man, I knew it was going to be tough. There's an article on the Huffington Post website, a parenting article, that somebody wrote about Rick and Dick. And it was profound what he said at the end of his article, so I'm going to read it to you. He says, I remember first reading about Rick and Dick Hoyt back in 2003, shortly after my youngest daughter was born. From that day forward... My attitude toward parenting changed significantly. He says, here I saw a man pushing himself to the brink of what is possible with a human body, and for what? Not fame, not for glory, not for riches, but simply for the opportunity to help his son feel free. If only for a few hours at a time. I knew then that sacrifices could and would become a mainstay of my relationship with all my children. Listen to what he writes here. When a father demonstrates his love through even the tiniest sacrifice, it is perceived in the eyes of a child as irrefutable evidence that nothing could ever come between them. Do you realize that God feels this way about you? I'm sorry, man, that gets me. The author does, because he says in verse 10, better is one day in your court than a thousand days elsewhere. What does it mean to be in the courts of God? I mean, for many of us, we kind of think of a literal physical place maybe we go to after we pass away. Maybe it's a place on earth that's our happy place. I mean, yesterday I was out in the woods, and I hadn't been in the woods just reflecting for a very long time, and I felt like I was in the figurative courts of God. However, I would argue that being in the courts of God is not only a physical place to which we must one day ascend, may one day ascend, but also a figurative place that our relationship with Christ will take us to on a daily basis. I mean, think about one of the Psalms that we already studied, Psalm 63, right? David was surrounded by his enemies, his own son was his enemy, surrounded by his enemies who wanted to take his life, who wanted to unthrow him, who wanted to kill him. And what were David's words? Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. David's physical situation did not dictate this response. But his faith in God did. I think of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verse 25. It records in scriptures that they were doing what? Praying and singing hymns to God and other prisoners were listening to them. That's what they were doing. But what was their physical situation? Their physical situation was that they were in a town and there was a girl who was demon-possessed. And Paul by the power and grace of God, cast the demon out of her. Because of that, this girl, she was a slave girl, her owners could no longer make money off of her. So they trumped up charges against Paul and Silas. And it says this in scriptures, the crowd then joined in the attack against them and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Remember, this is all going on because Paul cast a demon out of a girl. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet with stocks. And what were they doing? 
praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Their physical situation did not dictate this response, but their faith in God did. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Guys, we are often invited to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And we will experience it much this week. You will be invited to dine with the God of mammon, the God of greed, the God of excess, the God of physical pleasures. But Christ says in Matthew 6, 24, that you cannot serve two masters. You will hate one and despise the other, or you'll be devoted to one and, sorry, hate one and love the other, devoted to one and despise the other. Is it possible? Is it possible that the table of God is better than dining with the richest of physical foods? We say it, but do we live it? You see, in verse 4, the psalmist writes these words, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. I think he's referring in this point to those who have passed from life unto death to life again in the presence and power of God. Those who have completed the upcoming journey to Zion that some of the rest are on in this passage. You see, in verse 5, he says this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. The journey, the pilgrimage, the road to Zion. One of my favorite old school bands, Petra, wrote a song called The Road to Zion. The road to Zion is in your heart, and that's, that is etched in my mind and will be till the day I die. So what is Zion? Zion is the dwelling place of God. Zion is the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. See, that journey towards Zion, if you believe what's written in this book, if you believe what's written in the pages of this Bible, that journey towards Zion is either towards it or away from it. You cannot go both ways. You're either going towards Zion on your journey, the dwelling place of God, or you are traveling away from Zion. And I know this is not a popular truth in our culture, society, and world today. It fails to be inclusive of those who don't believe in Zion. Maybe it fails to be inclusive of those who believe that there is more than one way to Zion. It's interesting. A couple weeks ago, I drove to North Carolina. And, and, and if you're familiar, familiar at all with the trips to the Outer Banks of North Carolina... There is literally only one reasonable destination way to get to Corolla, North Carolina. Corolla, where we go, is on the uppermost part of the Outer Banks. Now, I say that understanding there's many ways to get to the Virginia Beach, Norfolk type of area. But once you're at that spot, there's literally only one way to go. You're going to go Route 168 South. It's going to turn into 158 South. It will take you onto the peninsula after you cross the Sound, and then you'll hit Route 12 North, and you will travel 12 North. To go any other way at all, any other path at all, detours you at least 75 to 100 miles. Takes you on to the, to the peninsula 25 miles south of where this bridge is. You have to cross three bridges to get on, and then backtrack north to the Route 12 interchange, and then north again. It doesn't make any sense at all. And what's ironic about that is even though, like I said, there's many ways to get from here to Norfolk, Virginia Beach area, if I've asked somebody for directions, nobody's ever said to me, you know what, Scott, you should, to get down there to the Norfolk, Virginia Beach, or to get down the Outer Banks, you should first head north for a couple hundred miles. Because I really think that's going to be your best and quickest way to get there. Or maybe you want to go west for about 300 miles, and then you can detour around some of those cities and come at it from the side. Or just go straight east until you hit the Atlantic Ocean, and just you can, you can snake down all the little side roads and you can just drive the ocean the whole way down. And you look at that person and be like, are you crazy? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Or at least the dumbest thing in the last three or four minutes, because it don't make sense. Why? Because in our physical world, it is very obvious that not all the roads lead to the same place, right? It's obvious. It's plain as day. If we cannot accept this simple, logical premise in our physical world, why do so many of us readily accept it in the spiritual world? 
Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 18 says, Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today. Do not turn to the right or to the left, following other gods or serving them. I was just reading about Josiah in my, in my, in my devotions last week. It says this about King Josiah. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as Josiah lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their fathers. You know how old Josiah was when he took over as king? Eight years. Eight years old. You see, the road design isn't necessarily easy or comfortable, is it? I mean, look at verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. This is more than likely a figurative place. Most translations don't understand there was no recorded place of Baca, a figurative place. One that people would pass through. One that is dry and weary and arid. But this valley of Baca is turned into an oasis for the weary traveler. Why? Because of God. We go through a lot of times of desolation on our life journeys, don't we? A lot of valleys. A lot of deserts. But this verse is saying that our trust in God can turn these times of difficulty, and I don't know how God does it, into times of joy. Maybe you want a formula and you say, but Scott, you're the pastor. You're supposed to know these complicated and, and explicit spiritual things. You're supposed to be able to tell me how I can turn my weeping into joy. And I can't because there's no ABC formula in the Bible. What I can tell you is that you, as you go closer to God, your times of trials and your times of troubles will seem less in your life. From desert to springs, from dryness to a place covered with pools by the autumn rains. And then we get to verse 7, and verse 7 is awesome. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Their journey, while not easy or routine, is accomplished through the strength of God, from strength to strength. I mean, it reminds me of one of my favorite chapters in all the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. By faith, these people did incredible things. But check it out. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 33 and 34 say this. I mean incredible things. By faith, these people, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Zion is the holy city of God. It is a destination for the journey. Do you know what it's like to arrive at your destination after a long journey? I mean, it could be a little literal destination, you know, a place you're traveling on holiday. If you ever watched the Booking.com commercials, you got this weary family walking down the hallways of this dilapidated old hotel, and they're just beat down, and they just want to get to their room, but they think it's a pretty nasty room because the hotel looks mad. And they open up the door, and the light shines through, and it's this beautiful Caribbean oasis, and the dad just raises his arms in triumph like, I am the king of the world because we are here, and we have arrived, and it all worked out. Maybe it is a physical destination. Maybe it's a figurative destination. Like I've told you before, I love watching the show The Biggest Loser and the journey that those people go through to get to the finale. Not just physical, but emotional as well. Some of them it's weight loss. Some of them it's being able to run a certain distance. Some of them it's being able to lift a certain amount of weight. But when you accomplish that goal, it's a big deal. You have reached your destination and it is gratifying. It gives you that, finally, I can exhale a little bit moment. I bring that up because that's the feeling you get from the author in verse 7 here. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Till each appears before God. This is my destination. If you believe this to be true, then I believe that you should possess an urgency in your life to share this with others. And you think about it. Imagine yourself in five days from now. You're doing something... Um, Imagine that you're doing something logical. 
Friday morning, day after Thanksgiving, you want to get up around 3, 4 in the morning and get ready to go hunting. That sounds completely logical to me. Some of you get up at that time and you want to go stand in a line outside of the store. That's completely illogical to me, but logical to you and the hunting sounds crazy and that's cool, right? If you're standing in line outside a door on Friday morning and, and you hear people in front of you talking, and maybe there's too much commotion you can't hear, I don't know, maybe there's not any commotion at all. And they're talking, think, yeah, as soon as this is done, I get my shopping done, I have to go visit my relatives in New York. And it's, but, but we're going to take the Kentucky route today. You know, we're going to go, we're going to go over through Kentucky. Would you step in and say something to them because they might be a little directionally challenged? You know, that's great. You should actually go the Colorado route to get to New York. No, did I hear you say Kentucky, right? You know, there's this little thing called Route 80. You hop on it, it takes you right into New York City. You'll be there in an hour and a half. You wouldn't want somebody driving 12 hours in the wrong direction to turn and drive 13 hours back to get to New York City, would you? You would have to say something. How can we be so stinking passive as followers of Christ when so many in our world are using extremely faulty spiritual directions? But then we get to verses 10 through 12, the culmination of this passage. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. They explain God's sovereignty, God's holiness. And the question of this passage that I have for you today is not, do you believe it or not, but do you know it to be true? Have you experienced this in your life? I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield, a sun, a provider of light, a source of guidance, a shield, a protector. He is the king. It's why people are loyal to their kings. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. We are blessed because we get to know and experience verses 10 and 11. Read them because they're awesome. Memorize them because they're awesome. It's what God wants for you and your life. Think about the power of Psalm 84. Incredibly reassuring. Incredibly powerful. And it should be incredibly transformational for you as a believer of Christ to reach out to others. You are a child of God. God loves you and God cares for you on a deeply intimate and emotional level. God wants you to live this way. God wants you to live with power. God wants you to live with strength. And God wants you to live in his knowledge. He wants you to share his love with a lost and hurting world. Will you take up your cross and follow him? Let's pray. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere, Father. Man, that should psych us up. That should get us excited. That should get us ready and raring to go. And even if we're feeling tired and physically or, or emotionally or spiritually drained today, Father, I believe if we truly knew how much you loved us and cared for us, if we truly grasped the depths of your love, the depths of your power, the depths of your wisdom and knowledge for us, we would be in awe and we would be humbled by your love. Better is one day in your presence, in your courts, in your home than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Father, may that be our heart's cry. You love us. You care for us. You give to us even when we don't deserve. Help us to get excited by that and to reciprocate that love, not only to you, but also to the world around us. Give us a heart and a passion for reaching the world with the good news of the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. And we'll give you all the honor. We'll give you all the glory all the time. May it always be about you, Father. May it never be about us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.